you uh, uh, kind of some numerical simulations of this uh, of this thresholding scheme so that you uh, get a better intuition of it. So, uh, uh, so here again is uh, uh, is the uh, uh, the scheme in its oops, simplest uh, version. So, uh, so it's a time discretization of uh, of mean curvature flow, and it prece proceeds by kind of looking at the characteristic function of the set, uh, the boundary of which evolves by mean curvature. And uh, the time step size is h, uh, like uh, what I did on the blackboard. So you're given the characteristic, uh, 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 the characteristic function of the set at time step n minus 1. You convolve it uh, with uh, uh, the heat kernel at uh, time h, which means I could also say you solve the heat equation with these initial data for time h. So now you get a smooth function. And then you look where this resulting function is uh, less or larger than one half. And uh, that defines uh, a, a new characteristic function or a new set. So that's the, uh, that's the scheme. And um, here, is, uh, here is a numerical simulation. So, uh, oops. Uh, so here uh, is a dumbbell sh shaped uh, 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 set uh, uh, at time step n minus one. Uh, you blur the picture by convolving. Uh, you find the uh, the level set of where the uh, level set of the function of one half, and that defines the new set. And you can detect that uh, uh, it's, it's slightly behaving as it should be. Uh, kind of this uh, 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 this thin part has thickened a little bit, uh, uh, as you would expect for uh, for mean curvature flow. And as I mentioned uh, last time, that's. Uh, uh, a low complexity scheme because convolution can be done very uh, efficiently after spatial discretization with almost optimal complexity and with not uh, difficult programming by the uh, fast Fourier transform. Uh, that's what I mentioned last time, that it satisfies the comparison principle and that's the basis for uh, convergent proofs. And here is uh, uh, the multiphase version and, uh, and in a certain sense, that's what makes this interesting, that uh, essentially the same idea, uh, uh, the same idea uh, kind of uh, works for uh, multi-phase versions. So uh, uh, you're describing a partition of your space by the cor corresponding characteristic functions that sum up to one. Uh, you do exactly the same thing as before. You do uh, a convolution step where you uh, convolve all the uh, characteristic functions and then you ask where, uh, which of the characteristic functions is largest in a given point. And, uh, uh, and here you see uh, uh, kind of a, a purely academic numerical simulation where uh, you, uh, you have this fairly irregular partition, you uh, mollify it, uh, you ask uh, for uh, which, uh, which of the, these three functions dominates, you get uh, a new arrangement and so on, and you can already see that uh, after a single time step, you get the right angle condition for free, uh, which here in this case is just that all three angles have to be uh, equal. And, uh, and th that makes it, uh, um, so in fact, mean curvature was introduced in material science. And, uh, uh, and this is a kind of the fact that you can use this for many, many phases makes it interesting for what's called grain growth in material science, so a three-dimensional version of networks. And, uh, and these three authors have demonstrated that you can really uh, kind of simulate uh, 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 several thousands of grains in, uh, in, in three space dimensions and can do statistics on it. And, uh, uh, but the multi-phase case in a certain sense, I mean, there's only this recent result by uh, last week's speakers and this week's participant uh, that, uh, um, that uh, at least in the sense of Bracke, um, a solution exists. Okay, so uh, 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 this, uh, this is was, let, let me briefly recap what we did uh, yesterday. So this was, I started with telling you about this uh, uh, minimizing movement uh, work uh, of the Georgie, which uh, by the right type of interpolation recovers the, uh, the exact, uh, uh, or the energy, the dissipation inequality without loss. And, uh, and then I formulated, uh, 
uh, uh, two results. Uh, the first one, definitely, I want to uh, uh, give you the argument for that this minimizing movement scheme is indeed, uh, sorry, that the thresholding scheme is indeed a minimizing movement scheme and uh, uh, that this minimizing movement scheme has to do with mean curvature flow uh, in the sense, uh, in the one sense, I mean, before you, before proving a convergence result, in the sense that the energy functional converges to uh, the parameter, so the uh, area of the interface, written in this uh, BV uh, type fashion. So those were the two results which I already stated last time. So uh, let me um, um, uh, give you the argument for uh, at least the first one. So. So uh, let's look at this uh, um, functional one has to minimize um, and uh, so that's uh, the energy EH plus 1 over 2H square uh, DH square U chi N minus 1. And let's plug in the definitions. Uh, so uh, that's uh, 1 over square root of h, uh, the integral of u, uh, of 1 minus u times gh uh, convolved with u uh, plus 1 over square root of u, um, u minus chi, gh u minus chi. So that's, uh, I just copied what's, uh, what's on the blackboard. And now you have to, uh, now there is a simple algebraic uh, um, uh, uh, transformation which uh, you see best by realizing that this uh, expression here defines a, a, a symmetric uh, bilinear form. So let me just use this notation. So this is 1 minus u comma u plus uh, u minus chi comma u minus chi. And if you uh, use kind of elementary linear algebra, you see that this can be rewritten as minus uh, u uh, 2 chi minus 1 plus chi chi. I hope that's correct. So uh, uh, this term is sitting here. Um, the quadratic term in u cancels with the quadratic term in u here. The quadratic term in chi is sitting here and the mixed term between u and chi with the minus sign is sitting here. So that's just linear algebra. So what does that mean? Um, that means uh, we have minus uh, the integral of u uh, gh convolved with 2 chi minus 1 plus uh, chi gh convolved with chi. This second term is completely irrelevant for this variation of problem since it does not depend on u. And only the first term is relevant for the variation problem. In fact, it's a, you know, a linear term. And using the fact that uh, uh, the Gaussian has integral 1, I can rewrite this as the uh, convolution of 2 times gh minus 1. And uh, if, uh, if we do this, uh, we see two things. We see that, so we want to minimize this expression. So we want to minimize this expression, which means we want to maximize this expression, uh, which means uh, we can do that if we choose u to be equal to 1, where this is positive, and equal to 0, where this is negative. So in this case, we get uh, that this is equal to minus 2 times gh chi minus 1 if u is equal to the characteristic function of the set where the convolution is larger than 1 half. But, uh, but that's really the smallest value this expression can have for any u, remember that uh, u is a function which assumes the values between 0 and 1, that's really kind of the, the, the smallest value it can ever assume. So it's, this is um, equal to this value, but it's always 
at least as large as this value. And therefore, we see that uh, this function here indeed is the minimizer. And that was just thresholding. So, uh, so by very simple calculation, you see that uh, that thresholding indeed is, uh, is, um, uh, has the interpretation uh, of solving this, uh, 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 this almost trivial variational problem. Uh, so uh, um, so that's, uh, that's certainly a very, very easy argument. And now kind of the, the work consists in, 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 in using this structure. And, uh, and the, first, uh, 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 the first part of the work uh, uh, cons uh, re uh, kind of uh, uh, consists in understanding the energy functional, and that's uh, proposition one, which tells you, well, the energy functional indeed has to do something with, uh, with what you would expect for mean curvature flow, which is the gradient flow of the interfacial energy, because this energy functional, as this parameter h converges to zero, converges to the uh, parameter functional. And, uh, and this, um, this lemma essentially, sorry, this proposition essentially relies on, uh, uh, for the, let's say for the most interesting part, relies on the following lemma. Uh, so that should be lemma three, which uh, I want to state now. So for any um, characteristic function, uh, we have the following three statements. Uh, we have that, This uh, functional, uh, this um, um, uh, this energy functional, which is defined up there, indeed is always bounded by buff by the parameter functional, and we have uh, monotonicity in the sense that as this parameter, so this holds in a pointwise point -wise in the configuration for any natural number n. Uh, so uh, so if, uh, uh, th this of course is not uh, really full monotonicity in this parameter n here because it's some kind of integer monotonicity. But in a certain sense what these two uh, uh, what these two inequalities tell you is that for fixed configuration, uh, these energy functional monotonically converge to the parameter functional. And, uh, and that's uh, as people who are a little bit familiar with gamma convergence will know is already kind of a main step for the, uh, 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 for, for the gamma convergence. Essentially, uh, that's, uh, that's essentially all all it relies, I mean, one needs, to, one needs the consistency, one also needs to know that uh, for fixed chi, E of H chi actually converges to this value as H goes to zero. Uh, that requires a kind of uh, a little bit of, uh, um, uh, via approximation is a classical argument. But in fact, these two inequalities are the most interesting part. And then there is a third uh, property, which I'm going to use later, which I want to state here. Uh, that uh, again for an arbitrary configuration, if you look at the L1 norm of the gradient of the convolution, it's estimated up to some constant by the energy. So the energy, even for finite age, is at least strong enough to control the uh, BV norm of the convolved configuration. So those are all three statements uh, for fixed configuration. Uh, let me... Um, let me, uh, uh, let me show you the proof at least of, uh, of the first two ones and then we'll see how much you want to see. So, three. So let's start with uh, uh, the, first, uh, um, the first inequality. So uh, I'm going to write down uh, the definition of the energy functional. Uh, 
And I'm using uh, something which I already used over there, that this is kind of symmetric in these two arguments, so I can also write it like this. And uh, now I'm using Fubini in the sense that I, uh, um, this is uh, an integral in x, uh, and if I'm not saying anything, it's always in x, uh, when it's integrated in x, it's always over the unit cell. But now there is a second integral in here, uh, which, is, which comes from the convolution, and I'm exchanging the orders of integration and pull the uh, convolution integral outside. So therefore, I get uh, the integral over uh, the entire Rd. So integrals over z are always to be supposed, implicitly supposed to be over the entire Rd. And now here we have the unit cell, and we get 1 minus chi times x, chi times x minus z, plus uh, chi times x, uh, 1 minus chi x minus z dx, dz. So, uh, and I've, just, I've just rewritten the, uh, the functional. And uh, now you realize that this expression, because chi is a characteristic function, uh, this expression is nothing else than The, uh, the difference, uh, the modulus of the difference of chi at x and chi at x minus z. And now because of periodicity, so here you're looking, uh, you're looking in, at an L1 modulus of continuity of your characteristic function chi. You're looking at the L1 difference between chi and shifted chi. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, by, if you want the mean value property, you can estimate that by the L1 norm of the gradient. And if you uh, think a little bit about it, uh, uh, what you get is, uh, uh, as, an as an integrand, you get the direction in which you shift times the normal vector. So nu is, like always in the BV context, the measure theoretic normal. And uh, so that's the estimate which you get. And now you, uh, I mean, here, you, here we used Fubini in kind of exchanging and pulling the x integration outside. Now you pull the z integration outside, like it was originally. Uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, so we pulled the z integration outside, now we pull it in. And uh, uh, you see that you get, um, So I should write it like this. Uh, we get this expression. And um, so now we have to look at, uh, we have to look at, this, uh, at this integral here. So first of all, by rotational symmetry of the Gaussian, you realize that it does not depend on, in which, on which direction this unit vector points. So, uh, I could uh, just take the, uh, without loss of generality, I could take the first, uh, uh, the first direction. So that's using the rotational symmetry. Um, now uh, I'm changing variables, uh, recalling that the Gaussian of variance H was nothing else than the Gaussian of variance 1 rescaled by square root of H. So if I change variables and uh, I bring this in here, uh, you realize that this is just the integral of the unit Gaussian times uh, the uh, modulus of the first component. And now you uh, use the fact that the Gaussian, in fact, is, uh, is something which is tensorial. So it's uh, the one-dimensional Gaussian in the z1 variable times the uh, d minus 1 dimensional Gaussian in the other variables. And you use Fubini here, you write that as an integral in z1, integral in dz prime. 
in the integral in, in Z prime, uh, that is equal to one because of the normalization of the Gaussian. So this in fact is, let me continue here, is just a, a one dimensional integral of the 1D Gaussian of unit variance Z1 dZ1. And I forgot somewhere the uh, factor of one half, which, uh, now is, which came in here, which now is important. Because I can write this by symmetry of the Gaussian as the integral from zero to infinity of uh, this expression. So the 1D Gaussian uh, is equal to one over square root of two pi uh, exponential minus Z1 square over two. And uh, if you multiply it with Z1, I'm sure you have often seen or you have seen this calculation, uh, this is nothing else than the derivative of the 1D Gaussian. So therefore, up to a minus sign, uh, so therefore this integral is, um, let me continue here, uh, this integral is, uh, is easy. It's just the uh, 1D Gaussian evaluated at the origin. And now you look once more at the formula and you see that this is equal to uh, one over two pi square root, which we call C0. So, uh, uh, so that shows, uh, that in a certain sense explains why in this gamma convergence result, this constant C0, which is one over square root, uh, one over the square root of two pi comes up. It's already present in this simple inequality, sharp inequality, which holds for uh, any uh, characteristic configuration. Okay, let me also, because that's, uh, uh, that's perhaps uh, uh, more interesting, let me also show you this monotonicity property here which uh, uses essentially uh, a similar uh, trick. So now, I'm sorry? So let's, uh, let's think of chi as being, uh, chi as being smooth. And uh, so we're looking at this integral here. Uh, now it's over the period cell, but uh, it's easier to think about the whole space. And so uh, you write this here as the integral from zero to one, gradient chi x minus tz dot z uh, dt, uh, and now you use uh, Jensen in the dt integral, and you get uh, that this is equal to uh, the integral gradient chi x minus tz dot z dx dt. Now that by translation invariance of the Lebesgue integral, I can get rid of this translation. And, uh, and this here I can write uh, as uh, the integral uh, of z chi over modulus of chi times red chi. And that's, the, uh, that's exactly the, uh, the formula. And now, uh, now you do an approximation argument. So chi, in fact, is a, is, is a, is, is a characteristic function of a Cacciopoli. Of B, so you, you use the fact that, uh, that you can approximate BV functions by smooth functions. And that, uh, in this case, this, ex, this uh, classical expression turns into the measure theoretic normal. Okay, so that's. Okay, so let's look at, oops, at this uh, monotonicity. So let me start with uh, uh, the left-hand side. And let me use uh, 
this uh, representation, which we already had here. And uh, so this would be uh, 1 over n square, 8 square root, uh, the integral e g n uh, h square uh, of z, uh, the integral of chi of x minus uh, z minus chi of x dx dz. Uh, let's do another change of variables, which you already did over there, to get the unit Gaussian here. Uh, so this gives uh, 1 over n, 1 over square root of h, uh, g1, z, so I should call it z hat, but uh, x minus uh, n times square root of h, z minus chi of x, dx, dz. So, so far, this is an exact identity. And now it's clear what you're doing. Uh, you're just using the triangle inequality in uh, L1 to write this here as the uh, sum going from n, little n from 1 to infinity, uh, chi x minus n square root of h z minus chi x minus n minus 1 square root of h times z dx, and you use translation invariance of the integral on the torus to see that all these terms are actually the same term. And uh, so with the sum, it's just n times that term. And uh, now you see that these two n's cancel. And indeed, you get that this is, by, def by, by the same formula, that this is less than the energy of chi. So, uh, uh, so, so this, uh, this monotonicity is, uh, is, is a very robust property. And in fact, it also holds nicely for the multiphase case. You just need a triangle inequality for your different interfacial uh, surfaces, uh, interface, as you would expect. So, uh, so as I said, everything here generate. I mean, I'm always presenting the results and the proofs in the case of just two phases uh, or a single boundary, but uh, things generate to uh, generalize to the general uh, general case. Um, okay. So now I, I guess I'm going to ask you what uh, what other proofs you want to see before starting on the proof. So there is a second lemma. Uh, which I need in the order to uh, um, prove a compactness result, which is what finishes the first chapter of preliminaries. So the um, uh, so the. I'm giving you lemma four in a second. Uh, so the compactness statement reads, uh, so let um, chi zero, the initial data, be such that the parameter energy is finite. And let chi n, n and n, be a solution. Uh, well, in fact, I could even write the solution. Uh, of uh, the thresholding scheme uh, with initial data chi zero and time step size h. Consider the uh, piecewise linear interpolation, so we're not yet doing the Georgi's interpolation. So piecewise linear interpolation uh, means uh, that uh, chi superscript h at some time t, this characteristic function, is equal to chi n, the nth step, for t between nh and n plus 1h. So the uh, 
if this is the time axis, uh, zero, h, two h, three h, uh, you put uh, chi zero here, chi one there, and so on, chi two there. Uh, then uh, chi h, then as uh, the time step size goes to zero, uh, chi h is compact in um, the L1, but then also any LP topology um, in uh, time space. So that's the torus, that's the time interval. And since I can't really go uh, with uh, uh, two infinite times, I have to put a lock here or a finite time horizon. So, uh, uh, so this fifth lemma tells you uh, that uh, um, we can always, there's always a limit. We can select a subsequence. I mean, for any, uh, for any sequence of time step sizes that go to zero, uh, we can select a subsequence of the outcome of the scheme and it will converge to uh, an evolving set. I mean, the strong convergence here is important for the limit to be a characteristic function again. So, uh, so that of, that's always, in a certain sense, an easy part in this type of analysis. Uh, in probability theory, you would call it tightness. And, uh, um, uh, and then, of course, all the work consists in identifying the limit. And in order to prove this, uh, we need uh, the fourth lemma, which uh, is uh, just, uh, just three statements on, uh, on, uh, on the relation between the energy functional and the metric. Uh, so the first relation is that if you're interested in the difference between the convolved and the unconvolved function, you can control this by, um, by the energy. This is little o of square root of h if the energy stays bounded. Um, there's a second statement that if you look at two configurations, u and u prime, uh, then the um, L2 difference, the squared L2 difference is estimated by Uh, something which involves the, uh, the distance. I'm looking for the right prefactor. One over two square root of h d h square u u prime plus uh, this term Of both energies, and then it's also convenient to have that the, uh, if you look at the differences of energies for two configurations, and you look at the uh, square, then this is estimated by one over two square root of h to the power three, or h to the power three halves, times dh square u, u prime. And this last inequality is, uh, will need it at some point for the variational interpolation. And, but at this stage, it tells you that for fixed h, e is indeed a continuous functional, even a Lipschitz continuous functional with respect to the metric dh. Okay, and, the, uh, and the, uh, the idea is now that we're going to prove lemma five, if you want, uh, uh, lemma five based on, uh, on this here and on these two things. So, uh, Uh, that, that would be kind of now uh, get, getting more into details. Uh, alternatively, I could start telling you about uh, uh, the convergence proof. 
which is kind of the next, uh, would be the next section. So, uh, so now you have the choice of either uh, seeing uh, kind of a bit more details, I mean getting some, uh, getting some intuition on these, uh, on these functionals and uh, uh, some of easy manipulations and how you get a semi-interesting result, this compactness result, or moving onwards. Who's in favor of seeing the details? Who is in favor of moving onwards? That's pretty uh, equal. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. So, um, uh, so for a certain class, and that's something Selim Ezedoglu has worked out, for a certain class of uh, anisotropies, uh, you keep kind of good both, I mean you can, uh, you can get that from a thresholding scheme with a kernel which has kind of both good properties, namely of being non-negative in real space and non-negative in Fourier space. So in a certain sense for this, uh, for this minimizing movement interpretation, the non-negativity in Fourier space is perhaps even more important because only that guarantees you that you can take kind of a square root, uh, which is important for, for the metric. So, uh, um, so if one's willing to give up more, uh, I, think, uh, I think essentially you can do uh, things for all, uh, for all anisotropies, but there are nicer anisotropies uh, uh, where definitely everything should be uh, should go through. We didn't in, in the work with Tim uh, Laux. Um, we didn't uh, really look at the anisotropic case. We treated the multiphase case and the case where every uh, kind of uh, 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 grain boundary may have a different isotropic interfacial tension. And that uh, that uh, in this case there are no practically no changes. And in the other case, there would be some changes, but my feeling is that for this class of zonoidal and isotropies, as Selim calls them, it should be fine. More questions? Yes? Yes, so, so it, even if it would slightly deviate from one half, uh, on the natural, on the physical time scale, your set would shrink or invade the entire space. I mean, if, uh, if the threat, uh, so in fact, that's something which Tim Laux worked out, that if, um, uh, if you perturb it by around one half with, uh, I mean, if you, if you twist one half by something that's of the order of, I guess, square root of h, uh, or h square, now I forgot, but if you, I mean, if you, if you modify it in a very controlled way, uh, then you get motion by mean curvature uh, plus uh, kind of a constant speed. So, uh, uh, so uh, and in fact, uh, uh, and, but this, uh, this was already known before. Uh, um, uh, you can also get the uh, um, motion by mean curve, motion by area, motion by volume preserving mean curvature flow by modifying the, uh, this uh, uh, thresholding scheme by insisting that you choose the threshold so that your new answer has exactly the same volume as the old answer. And, uh, and also in this case you get uh, uh, um, things can be, uh, uh, can be, uh, can be adapted. Sorry again? Plus a constant velocity. I think there is no uh, there is no problem of uh, of uh, kind of deciding a number whether a number is larger or less than one half to machine precision. 
And then, of course, if, if, square, if H now is smaller than the machine precision, then things might go wrong, but I, th I don't think that one ever operates, uh, okay. operates in, that, uh, in that regime. So, I mean, threat, I mean, uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, stability with respect to spatial discretization errors, and so that, of course, is important, but, uh, but that, I mean, thresholding, I think. Okay, so the effect amounts to equal to Yes, the yes, okay. yes. I mean, so, so the deviation would have to be larger than some power of h, some moderate power of h. Now, I forgot h square or square root of h, and typically that's, I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's not the machine precision. More questions? Okay, so now I got a split vote on, uh, uh, on, uh, on what, to, uh, what to present to you. So uh, I don't know how, is it, so I mean I, I, wrote down, uh, I wrote down the proofs by hand. Is it possible to scan that and put it on the web? Uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then you, uh, you can look at it and, uh, and then you can still ask me, uh, uh, ask me tomorrow, by tomorrow. I mean, if, is it possible to get them on, onto the web today? Okay, then, uh, uh, then you can tell, me, uh, can tell me tomorrow whether you, want to see, uh, whether you want to see some of the proofs. And the other situation might be that I run out uh, with what I've, what I've prepared, and then, uh, um, uh, and then uh, um, I, I will use the remaining time to uh, give, you, uh, give you the proofs. Okay, so... Um, uh, so, uh, so I'm going to uh, erase uh, these statements now. Anyway, they're also uh, I have them also on the screen. Here is uh, here are these two things, and And now let me start with the, uh, with the second chapter, which contains the main results and, uh, and the connection to the work by Andrin, Taylor, and Wang, and, uh, and the, uh, the Bracke notion. And, and, and by the way, I mean, so you, I can also give proofs after, after I mean, I have a second session to, um, this, um, this afternoon. So if you come to me and say, I, mean, I really want, I really want to see uh, some of these proofs, I can be, can be easily convinced. So uh, main result. Uh, so I'm going to tell the wrong. So, uh, so let me start with, a, um, uh, with an informal observation. So it is kind of well appreciated by, uh, by, by the uh, mean curvature flow community that uh, mean curvature flow, in fact, is a gradient flow formally. Of, um, what you would expect. Uh, if I use the BV notation, I write it like this, uh, but of course, classically, it's just the uh, uh, Hausdorff measure of the, uh, um, of the uh, boundary of the set. Uh, and uh, uh, why, why, why is it not surprising that something gives, like this gives rise to curvature? Because the first variation And so let me use this notation for the first variation. So I had one notation for metric slope and one notation for uh, first variation. So if you look at the first variation of, uh, of the interfacial area in direction of a vector field xi, so xi will always, in my case, denote uh, a time or time-independent vector field. Uh, so here, which, of course, 
lives on the same domain, uh, is, uh, as uh, many of you will know, is given by integrating, uh, the weak formulation is given by integrating the uh, tangential divergence, which I can write as the ambient divergence minus the uh, normal, normal part, uh, which uh, classically is just the uh, integrating the mean curvature um, times uh, nu xi. So in my, not in my notation, the mean curvature is a scalar and uh, uh, that's the mean curvature vector. So uh, that's the first variation. So the first variation brings up mean curvature. So uh, mean curvature flow is the gradient flow of the area functional uh, uh, if, uh, you, uh, if you consider the metric, so with respect to uh, the infinitesimal metric given by the inner product um, of the uh, L2 space on the, uh, on the boundary. So as it stands, this is just uh, almost tautological. And, uh, um, and the first problem uh, with this type of, uh, if now, so if now you wanted to uh, use this insight to write down a minimizing movement scheme, uh, you run into the following problem. Uh, so namely the problem that the uh, uh, distance function, which comes from this infinitesimal metric from this infinitesimal, from this Riemannian structure is degenerate. So however, the induced distance function uh, of this formal uh, Riemannian structure uh, vanishes is degenerate in this sense. And that's, uh, I think, something which, uh, was, which many people were aware of, but uh, which Michel and uh, Mumford uh, pointed out uh, not that long ago. And uh, therefore, uh, if you want to write down a minimizing movement scheme uh, without knowing the thresholding algorithm, you have to come up with a proxy. So, hence, for uh, minimizing movement scheme, a la de Georgi, proxy or substitute something which acts a little bit like what you would expect the uh, induced distance to be um, for the induced distance or induced metric. And that's exactly what, uh, uh, what Almgren, Taylor, and Wang proposed uh, in 93 by saying that uh, chi n minimizes, ah, in fact, there is uh, for, for uh, um, uh, for technical reasons, it's convenient to look at mean curvature flow up to a factor of two. So the normal velocity, two times the normal velocity is given by, uh, uh, by mean curvature, then things come out nicely with thresholding. So V always denotes the normal velocity. And H, the uh, mean curvature. Mean curvature in the sense that it's the trace of the uh, um, exterior curvature, I mean the Weingarten map. And uh, so uh, chi n minimizes uh, the uh, parameter functional plus uh, uh, 1 over 2h. And then comes the following expression. Uh, you take uh, the uh, um, non-negative, so the unsigned distance function in uh, Rd to uh, your previous, um, uh, to the boundary of your previous configuration, and you integrate 
this uh, distance function over the symmetric difference uh, between the new set and uh, the previous set. And I think here you, we need a factor of four, which uh, comes from, uh, from this two here. So, uh, so that's, the, uh, that's the famous Angren Taylor Wong scheme. So you minimize, if I would write this geometrically, you minimize the uh, uh, surface area of the boundary and keeping, keeping track of this, uh, this type of distance to the previous time step. And uh, so, um, uh, in their original paper, they had a, had a kind of uh, a very conditional convergence proof of this, and that was, uh, to my understanding, improved, but still uh, uh, being conditional by uh, Stuck, uh, uh, Luckhaus and Sturzenhecker. And the statement is, uh, is as follows. So uh, let uh, consider uh, a sequence of uh, time steps that goes to uh, zero and uh, a limiting configuration uh, which uh, satisfies that uh, the uh, piecewise linear, uh, sorry, piecewise constant interpolation converges in L1 to chi let's say, um, over a finite time horizon up to capital T. And uh, so this is something which is a benign assumption because, uh, well, I mean, here we have to work more, but uh, kind of compactness is, uh, is, is also not a problem in this setting. But now comes the, uh, which only makes it a conditional convergence result, namely that um, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, parameter of the uh, approximating sequence, so the sequence which comes out of the scheme, then this should converge to uh, the parameter of the limit. And, uh, and that is indeed uh, a kind of, uh, 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 a non-trivial assumption which cannot typically not be checked, uh, at least presently not be checked for the scheme. So let me just comment on it. There is one direction which you get for free here. So by lower semi-continuity, you always get for free that the uh, uh, time integrated uh, um, BV norm of the limit is uh, less than that of the approximating sequence. So uh, in assuming this, uh, the main assumption you're making is that the parameter does not drop in, in the limit. And what this does for you is that it morally rules out ghost interfaces. So it shouldn't be the case that on the positive H level, uh, you have two, uh, uh, two interfaces which uh, get closer and closer. They don't have to be straight. And in the uh, limit, so here is chi is equal to one, chi is equal to one, and chi is equal to zero. And in the limit, it's gone because you're looking at it not from a very full point of view uh, where you count multiplicity, but you look at it from, uh, from a BV point of view where you disregard multiplicities. And, uh, and that's the situation. I think that is, this, that is essentially what you're ruling out by this assumption. But if you make this assumption, then, um, uh, then you're fine. Uh, so then uh, there exists a normal velocity V, uh, which is square integrable with respect to the interfacial measure in the sense of uh, that um, it's really, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's the normal velocity of the characteristic function in the distributional sense. So that means that uh, uh, V times uh, uh, zeta, V times red chi, uh, plus uh, the integral of uh, dt zeta times chi, 
uh, is equal to uh, minus the integral at t is equal to zero of chi zero. And here I need uh, um, uh, space time integrals for any test function zeta. Um, So there exists, uh, there exists such a normal velocity, and, uh, and uh, we have that uh, uh, the normal velocity is equal to the mean curvature in uh, this sense, which is uh, suggested by, uh, by this weak formulation of uh, mean curvature. That means uh, we have Again, a space-time integral uh, divergence psi minus nu d psi nu uh, minus 2 v psi nu red psi uh, dt is equal to zero for any test vector field psi. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's their, uh, their result. Uh, so uh, this uh, Armgren-Taylor-Wong scheme, uh, which is based on the idea of minimizing movements, but historically it might even have been the other way around that Armgren-Taylor-Wong uh, wrote down the scheme and then the Georgi uh, kind of uh, embedded this uh, uh, in, in the th more general theory of minimizing movements. So anyway, so... Uh, uh, that this type of minimizing movement scheme for mean curvature flow uh, converges in this conditional sense. In the sense that if you make this, uh, uh, this extra assumption of no ghost interfaces, then for, any, uh, for all times, it converges to weak solution of, uh, of mean curvature flow in, uh, in, in the specified sense. And, uh, and that is, is a pretty involved work. I mean, it uses... Uh, to some extent, uh, uh, regularity theory for minimal surfaces to get, uh, uh, to get that these sets are nice behaved, not uniform in H, but for a fixed H. And, uh, um, and in a certain sense, the most de delicate term is to uh, recover this, uh, 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 this metric term in the limit. And now what we did, uh, but that's not the result which, I'm, which I wanted to focus on, is essentially the same result uh, uh, for the uh, for the thresholding scheme, so uh, so, so this here is uh, the piecewise uh, constant interpolation of Armgren Taylor one. And now our theorem uh, which uh, was published uh, uh, two years ago uh, is exactly the same thing, just with the only uh, uh, with the with the following difference so uh, um, so uh, now this is the uh, piecewise constant uh, interpolation of uh, thresholding. And uh, here we have to take the moral equivalent. So uh, we're integrating these energy functionals EH over time and we want them to converge to the limit. So that's, uh, that's uh, the uh, kind of the moral uh, substitute in our framework uh, of the uh, assumption of Lukas and Stutzenhecker, and it's essentially the same type of assumption, then we get the same result. 
And in fact, I would say our proof is uh, because uh, the thresholding scheme involves less subtle geometry, uh, like looking at distance functions to boundaries of set, our proof is, uh, is perhaps uh, less technical, more robust. So we definitely don't use, I mean, we just use, uh, well, I mean, a little bit ideas of kind of excess and, but then essentially structure, uh, structure theorem for, for BV functions. And, uh, and again, uh, the term one has to work most uh, in both proofs is, is to pass to the limit here. Okay, so that, uh, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, what's, uh, what's around, what has been around uh, so far. But then we ask the question, um, so since both, uh, since both kind of convergence results start from minimizing movements, so start from natural discretizations of gradient flows, either in this academic way of the armgren taylor wong scheme or in kind of this numerically relevant way of thresholding, at least the limit should satisfy the dissipation inequality. So the question is, is it true that for the limit, if you look at the uh, rate by which the interfacial energy decreases, and I have to put a factor of two here because of this factor of two, uh, do I get that this is at least as an inequality given by integrating uh, the square over the mean curvature? And, uh, and that's not, I mean, this, uh, this, in a certain sense, is not strong enough to derive that uh, dissipation inequality. So the notion, this notion of uh, weak solution is not strong enough. And, and this is a little bit uh, dissatisfactory, right? Because uh, you start from gradient flow, the dissipation inequality is hardwired into gradient flow. You're using kind of a natural time discretization for a gradient flow, but uh, you're deriving a kind of a, a notion of a limit that doesn't even allow for, for this basic property of a gradient flow. And, uh, uh, and therefore, so, so that, was, uh, that was dissatisfactory. And therefore, uh, we, um, uh, uh, well, we wanted to get this, and we were kind of uh, were aware that uh, um, this issue of getting the right dissipation is, in fact, at the basis of uh, Brache, Brache's notion of uh, uh, um, mean curvature flow. So uh, this is so the dissipation inequality. in a localized version is, uh, is just, uh, is, is, is what, uh, what Bracke's notion is built on. So let me remind you what, uh, uh, what this means. So, uh, 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 and le but let me still use this BV notation. So, uh, uh, given a localizing function zeta, which uh, is, uh, let's say, smooth and, of course, periodic and non negative, uh, you want to monitor the rate by which, um, uh, by which this localized surface measure changes. And, uh, and so by purely kinematic uh, calculation or classical calculation, you see that uh, there are um, now more than uh, one configuration, um, contribution. There is what you would expect, namely the localized uh, 
the localized term uh, which comes from uh, uh, the localized term uh, which, which look, looks like this one here. But then there must be another, it's clear that there must be another term because even, uh, um, even if, uh, 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 even, you know, I mean, even if nothing dramatic would happen, uh, your uh, interface could move out of the region where this uh, function is looking at. So there is also a transport term, and sorry, I, sorry, I wanted to write down the purely kinematic formulation, so this would be normal velocity times uh, mean curvature, but then also the, um, you're moving out of uh, the, um, uh, what you see by the cutoff function, so you get a transport term like this. So that's a curvature effect and that's a transport effect. And uh, so this one, you clearly see that, uh, so if zeta is constant, then you, uh, uh, then you kind of end up with the classical inside that the, uh, um, uh, uh, that the um, uh, first variation of the area functional is given by mean curvature so that the rate of change is given by normal velocity times mean curvature. And, uh, but uh, now since due to the cutoff function, due to the non-constancy uh, non of zeta, you get such a transport term. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the notion of mean curvature flow is encoded uh, by requiring that, um, now let me put in the factor of two again. This here is lesser or equal to minus zeta h squared plus gradient zeta dot nu times h red chi for all non-negative test functions. And it's, uh, in a certain sense, at the basis of, uh, uh, of Bracke's uh, notion of solution that for smooth evolutions, uh, this here really characterizes, despite the fact that you just have an inequality sign, characterizes mean curvature. That's, uh, uh, that's, the, uh, um, that's the insight. Then, of course, he used very folds to formulate that in a kind of more robust way. Uh, that's something I will not be using. I, I wish uh, we could, but uh, that's something which I will not be using here. Uh, so I will stick to this BV type notation and the BV setting. Uh, but, uh, but even before that, uh, the main idea is that you can encode uh, uh, an equality, uh, PDE, by an inequality. And that's something which, uh, you know, I mean, clearly is also present in the general gradient flow theory of, uh, uh, of um, uh, um, De Giorgi, but uh, is, is present in, in many other situations. So, for instance, this notion of uh, weak solutions to compressible Euler equation, for instance, Eduard Feireisel is kind of one of the main uh, uh, people working in that area, also works with inequalities. So it's not unusual that, uh, that PDEs can be characterized by inequalities, and that's, um, that's one instance. Okay, so, so therefore we were right away a little bit, mid, a little bit more ambitious and asked the question, well, uh, can we, sh instead of just uh, getting uh, this global dissipation inequality, can we get this entire family of uh, uh, dissipation inequalities? And that's indeed uh, the result, and that's kind of the result which I would like to uh, explain a bit better in this uh, course. So that's theorem three. So we posted it last year, but now there is kind of a, uh, a new version. And again, that works in the multi-phase case. Uh, so, uh, so the assumption is very much like there. So let me put it again for completeness. So uh, uh, for uh, chi zero, uh, for initial condition with uh, finite uh, parameter, uh, let uh, chi n uh, denote the solution of 
the thresholding scheme at uh, for time uh, with, with these initial conditions and uh, time step size h, which I'm suppressing here in the notation. Uh, let uh, chi h denote the piecewise linear interpolation, uh, sorry, piecewise constant. So what, what I defined in uh, lemma five. Um, uh, let uh, chi be such that for subsequence uh, of h going to zero, we have exactly these two statements that the uh, interpolation of the thresholding scheme converges uh, in uh, L1 on time space and that uh, we have not just an inequality here, but uh, an equality. So that's the uh, unfortunate uh, assumption we, we need. Uh, but then we're fine. So then there exists a mean curvature. Uh, a mean curvature which is square integrable on the boundary in time space uh, and it's characterized in the usual weak way which is almost sitting here so uh, it holds that uh, zero t uh, uh, time integral of the tangential divergence of a test vector field uh, minus h times the normal component of this test vector field integrated over the boundary integrated over time is equal to zero for any test vector field. Well, let's take compact support in time, but that's not necessary. Uh, such that uh, uh, mean curvature flow in Bracke's uh, in, in form of Bracke's inequality is satisfied. So uh, by this uh, I mean, uh, um, now do I, how do I, I'm going to write it down. Let me write it down right away uh, uh, like, uh, like this. So that the uh, gradient, uh, that uh, zeta times the gradient chi at some point t uh, plus the integral from zero to t, the integral over space of h square, then I guess I need a minus sign here, and probably I forgot a two, no, I didn't, uh, that's okay, uh, minus, but then I need the two here, minus uh, gradient zeta, uh, gradient, sorry, yeah, gradient zeta dot nu times h, uh, gradient chi, uh, integrate over time is less or equal to two times uh, gradient chi zero. And this is uh, zeta. And this holds for all uh, zeta, uh, which uh, have, which is smooth. 
and periodic, of course, which are non-negative, and it holds for uh, almost every t. Okay, so that's uh, that's the uh, uh, that's if I didn't mess up with signs, uh, that's exactly the time the time integrated version of this formal inequality. Okay, so. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the that's the result I would like to uh, I would like to explain, and let me uh, let me comment that this the proof of this is much easier than the proof of this. So this is a much softer result. And that's uh, thanks to the uh, tools by the Georgi. So, uh, so here, uh, uh, here is here is where kind of the set of ideas comes together. Uh, on the one hand, uh, this numerical scheme, this thresholding scheme, which. Uh, which is uh, you know, a real practical and successful numerical scheme for mean curvature flow. Uh, this, uh, this very intelligent notion of encoding mean curvature flow as an inequality, which is due to Bracke, and which is a localized, which kind of uses the localized energy dissipation inequality and therefore is clearly related to the gradient flow structure and the tools by De Georgi on minimizing movements. So this is where, where kind of these three uh, areas which I said in the beginning come together. Okay, so uh, how much, what's, when I do have to, yeah. sir? I think the time is more or less over. More or less over, okay, probably that, that's a friendly way of saying it's over time already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so, uh, uh, right, so that's the, uh, uh, that's in a certain sense, the ma th those are, that's really now the main statement of what I want to uh, do in the rest, uh, in the rest of, uh, in the rest of the time. And uh, now you can, uh, um, you can either tell me uh, before uh, this afternoon you want to see some of the uh, ideas from the easier statements I gave before in order to get a little bit of better feeling of what these kind of objects really do. Uh, if you don't give me this uh, strong impression, we can post this uh, uh, tonight and you can have a look at that. And, uh, and then, if, if, so if, if I don't get this, uh, this feedback, uh, I would start telling you uh, how to uh, uh, go from the very first lemma by De Georgi uh, uh, with the variational interpolation uh, to, uh, to this inequality. And, uh, and the main step is, is, again, a very simple observation on the thresholding scheme namely that the th thresholding scheme doesn't just satisfy a single um, minimizing movement, uh, hasn't, hasn't, does not just have a single minimizing movement property, but it has a kind of a whole family of localized minimizing movement properties. And it's this nice feature of, uh, of the thresholding scheme uh, which, uh, uh, which we use to localize, to get to this kind of localized statement, and here I forgot the zeta. So, uh, so that's that would be uh, that would be for uh, for this afternoon if you uh, uh, if you don't tell me af otherwise. Okay, sorry for being over time, and uh, we'll continue over 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 time. <laughs>